I love the hush of a well-trained audience. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name's Sophie Lieberman, and I'm the Director of Public Education and Industry Programs here at ACME, the National Museum of Film, Television, Video Games, Art and Digital Culture. As we begin this evening, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the land of the Rudri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. It's my pleasure this evening to welcome you here for our session in partnership with La Trobe University, Forgotten Rebels from Page to Screen. My duties are mercifully few and very simple. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Associate Professor Claire Wright for bringing this event to ACME. We have a really strong commitment to television programming that provides the intersection between and insight between education, industry and public audiences. And I am confident this event is going to do that beautifully. We're in for a great conversation covering a breadth and depth of the how and why of television being made and consumed. I also need to thank La Trobe for their partnership. We're thrilled to be able to host um, Anne Kenny, who is their guest. Welcome, Anne. Um, and to be able to collaborate so meaningfully with La Trobe on bringing this event to you. Um, ACME is fortunate to have many supporters and for those of you here present this evening who are our members, I'd like to particularly thank you for your support. For the rest of you, uh, please consider becoming an ACME member, <laughs> not least for the benefit of first release tickets to our exhibitions, films and public programs. Uh, this evening is your cup of tea, our forthcoming ACME conversation series, which commences on the 4th of September, should also be in your diaries. Bookings are now open and there endeth the plug. Finally, I need to hand over to our chair for this evening, Danielle Binks, and we do have an online audience um, this evening. We are live streaming, so for those of you who want to ask a question, um, if we, I think we've just made up hashtag Forgotten Rebels, or um, you can tweet to the at ACME account or at Danielle underscore Binks, and we will endeavour to include those questions at the Q&A at the end. So Danielle is a writer, reviewer, youth literature advocate and a literary agent with Jacinta de Mace Management. She's a graduate of RMIT's professional writing and editing program. She has a Bachelor of Comms from Ma Monash University and has edited and contributed to um, the Harper HarperCollins edition, Begin, End, Begin, a hashtag love ya odds. Love Oz YA. Love Oz YA. There we Not go. Really I knew I was going to get that the wrong way around. Um, and anthology. I'm sure you will agree that we are in good hands this evening. Please join me in handing over and welcoming Danielle. Hello everyone. Despite all of that as my bio, I am mostly here because I'm a huge Outlander fan and a huge <laughs> history geek and because I do work at the literary agency that Claire is part of as author. So that's me legitimising myself. Yeah. I'm allowed to be here, I've been told. <laughs> I would love to introduce you all to Anne Kenny. She's been working as a television writer for more than 20 years and prior to that she was a newspaper journalist. Most recently, she worked as a writer and executive producer on the first three seasons of a little historical drama you may have heard of called Outlander. If you are unfamiliar, <laughs> allow me to quote a character on the TV show Jack Irish, who recently summarised the television show as a groundbreaking feminist time travel series that subverts the male gaze. Really? Accurate. That was on Jack Irish? Wow. That's Guy exciting. Guy Pierce, baby. Guy Pierce. <laughs> Accurate. <laughs> wow. Anne's other writing and producing credits include Switch to Birth. I love that show. Uh, Greek Family Law, Ea. I love that show. And <laughs> LA Law. Please welcome Anne Kenny. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Claire Wright is an award-winning historian, author and television writer, presenter who has worked in politics, academia and the media. She won the 2014 Stella Prize for her book, The Forgotten Rebels of Eureka, which was also shortlisted for the 2014 Prime Minister's Literary Awards and longlisted for the Walkley Awards. Her screenwriting credits include Utopia Girls, How Women Won the Vote for the ABC, and The War That Changed Us, also for the ABC, which was nominated for a Logie for Most Outstanding Factual Series. Claire is an Associate Professor at, of History at La Trobe University. <laughs> Please welcome Dr. Claire Wright. Now, I thought before we get into the nitty gritty of writing a television series and The Forgotten Rebels of Eureka, hashtag Forgotten Rebels, I thought we would all get on the same page and just discuss where we are actually at with the whole process of writing the television show, lest anyone be here thinking that they're going to be announcing the date of the Netflix drop 
or the day when you can start watching it on ABC for, uh, ABC iView. So just to dispel any one of those rumours, let's talk about what has happened with the funding from Latrobe, why Anne is actually in the country writing the script, and possibly how far off we are from actually getting to tell everyone, hey, tune in on this night for the premiere episode. Okay, so am I on? No. Is mine on? Yeah. Yes. Do you want to whistle Dixie there you while they... Uh, you're okay, I'm on. You're good. Right. <laughs> 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 so, my understanding is that we're probably, uh, at best case scenario, about two years off production. And that's because television takes a really long time to write. And not just the writing part, but the producing part, the production, and getting um, all of you who know what Droughtlander feels like <laughs> will understand <laughs> that um, that there are huge lag times uh, between seasons, and that's because it's such a huge venture. Getting something off the ground in the first instance is uh, is a huge venture, also. Fortunately, I'm a very patient person. It took me ten years to research and write the book in the first place, and uh, I certainly never went into that process ever expecting that this was going to be a television series so it's not like I'm chewing off all my fingernails waiting to um, be on the television with my clicker turning it on uh, but we've had some really fantastic steps along the way uh, the first one for me was having my book the screen rights to my book optioned by Ruby Entertainment and that happened in 2015 so um, Ruby Entertainment are a fantastic Melbourne based production company um, much loved in by Australian audiences for productions that they've done like Kath and Kim and Full Frontal and Fast Forward and more recently uh, and this is what really attracted them to um, me to them was for their adaptation of the Secret River. So fantastic um, the sensitive and uh, uh, adaptation of Kate Grenville's much-loved historical novel. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually was fortunate to be um, at the premiere of that event here in this theatre, so th it feels like the universe is speaking. And, uh, and uh, I loved what they did, and my agent Jacinta loved what they did so much with that, that um, we had a few companies vying for the rights, but we really we went with Ruby. Oh. Um, the next step along the way was to, to get development funding, and that's where Latrobe came in. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a call out at the university where I'm fortunate enough to work that something called the Strategic Innovation Fund was being started, which was uh, a, a, a money pot that would be there for research commercialisation. And I think research commercialisation, when academics hear that, they usually think biotech, um, information technology, drug patents, that sort of thing. But I thought, uh -huh, I've, I've got an idea that is fresh to take to market, to use really um, bald consumer, um, you know, kind of terms. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I put my idea forward and um, went through many stages and eventually was fortunate enough to get um, funding from La Trobe, which then allowed us to go the next step, uh, which was to bring Anne Kenny on board. And I'd already established a relationship with Anne. We, maybe we can talk which a bit we'll about that Which we'll go into. Spoilers. Um, we'll go into and so, um, so suddenly we had something to offer Anne, and um, and and now here she is. So the next step yeah. is for Anne to write the pilot. No pressure, Anne. Yeah, but no, we're all I very feel eager. No pressure, none. To start watching it right now. <laughs> and how how long do you need? A week? Three days? What? <laughs> yeah, two or three days anyway. You awesome. know, I think I'm going to do it on the plane on my way back, actually. Awesome. actually. I don't know if you're kidding or not, really. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm absolutely kidding. And I've discovered in the last two weeks that we spent together is just as much as a girl of a girly swat as I am. So I can guarantee you um, she's going to be doing her homework. Okay, all right. So just everyone to just adjust in expectations about two years. But that's not too bad because I just want to also offer you this little bit of context. I am also a fan of the Outlander book series by Janet Bolton. So um, I really feel all the pain of this I'm about to read out to you. The first book, Outlander, came out in 1991. In July 2012, it was reported that Sony Pictures Television had secured the rights to the series with Ronald D. Moore attached to develop. Sony closed the deal with premium cable network stars in November 2012. Moore hired a writing team, of which Anne was one of them, in April 2013. 
Principal photography began in location on location in Scotland in September 2013. The television show premiered in August 2014. That's 23 years from book to TV. <laughs> so this will be very fast. Yeah, most likely. You've already said three days, Anne. I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> <laughs> so again, just adjust your inner barometers for when <laughs> pop culture binging can begin. At least it's not 23 years, everyone. At least there's that. So now let's go into the proper stuff, the nitty gritty. And I'm gonna start with you, Claire, because, and it's not gonna surprise anyone when I hold this up this way, this book took 10 years to write. So let's begin there. Let's begin with why this story, because as a historian, you have the whole of human history to draw upon for your personal and professional life, of which 10 years is a fair big chunk. What was it about a battle that essentially took 20 minutes? 10 years, 20 minutes was the Eureka Stockade. <laughs> Why? Why the Eureka Stockade? What was it that made it stick in your craw that you had to spend 10 years of your life? And, f and furthermore now, talking about it. Okay. Uh, there are a number of ways that I could answer that, but I'm going to go with the one that, uh, that, that says, I think for many writers... Every new story comes out of the last story that you wrote. Some, some seed is sown somewhere along the way that you think, I have to go back to that. Um, I can't deal with it right now, but, you know, I'll put it on the back burner. And if that, um, if that project, is, if that seed is, is still kind of fermenting um, years later when you do actually find the time, then you know there's something right about it. And that was the story for me. So my PhD had been uh, History of Female Publicans in Australia. And that was published as my first book, which is called Beyond the Ladies' Lounge. And essentially what that did was to look at a space that had always been gendered male in Australian historiography and culture, the pub, uh, and to look at the involvement of women in that space. Um, and what I discovered through primary research, through um, evidence-based research, that women had always played a huge role in in hotel keeping industry in fact at the turn of the 20th century most hotel keepers were women so that really undermined the mythology of the australian pub and one of the things that um i, I uh, that one of the publicans i came across on that journey was a woman called i only knew her at the time as mrs bentley and mrs bentley was apparently the woman who said you can't break my windows Oh, and she didn't say it with that kind of southern accent. <laughs> oh, my God. I know. Where are we in the world? <laughs> she, she was an Irish Protestant lass, and I Don't can't do that. accents. Um, she, How dare you break my windows was her famous line in history. Um, but I didn't even know her, her first name. But she was the publican at Bentley's Hotel um, on the Eureka Lead in Ballarat in 1854 that was famously burnt down, and that event was often called... The, the spark that lit the wick, that lit the flame of Eureka. So I wondered, what, who is this Mrs Bentley? And I couldn't find out anything about her. I sort of did uh, a, a quick look at, at the Eureka literature, nothing. And I put her on the back burner. I couldn't. And so I went back to find Mrs Bentley, who I now know is Catherine Bentley, and I know a whole lot more about her, and she's in the book, and mm -hmm. she's going to be a, a character mm -hmm. in our series. And so it was really that process of my own curiosity. And I think that most good projects, certainly ones um, that you're going to stick with for a long time, need to come out of your own curiosity. And, and that was the case. And so like, like I had done with the pubs, I wanted to know, is this place and this event, which has always been gendered male in Australian history, in, in all of the school curriculum that I had learnt, primary school, high school. My mm -hmm. kids still learn about Eureka in, in school and it's always gendered male. There's the male miners and the male military mm -hmm. and they fought in that 20 minute mm -hmm. battle and out of that we have the birth of Australian democracy. Rights and freedoms were won mm -hmm. and, but all of those events, the characters, and indeed the values that came out of the event, things like collectivity, unity, um, standing up for your mates, standing up for your rights, all of those things had been gendered male as well. So I really wanted to go back to that story, wipe away the mythology, go back to the archive, back to the re records, to the evidence base, and build the story up from the ground and see who this Mrs Bentley was, was she the only woman there, if not, how many women? What mm -hmm. were they doing? And were they involved at Eureka? And and spoiler alert: are. there were a lot of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you want a quick summary? <coughs> uh, you're a little bit of a detective. 
Historians are sort of like detectives. Let me have that. I just want to imagine you as a detective. Oh, it, it, it's <laughs> true. And I'm, I'm no happier when, than when I'm, I'm buried deep in the archive with my Sherlock Holmes cap and my mm -hmm. pipe. No, you can't take your pipe into the archives. <laughs> you might burn them down. But when I'm really just down a rabbit hole, chasing, chasing a following lead. A thread. And following yeah. a thread and seeing what might be at the end of it. That's mm -hmm. amazing. And I think, Anne, if I can just delve into your background, which mm -hmm. I find utterly fascinating, you have a little bit of crossover with Claire, I think, especially on the detective realm, if you'll <laughs> allow me to <laughs> muse on this. Your background was majored in journalism at Ohio University, mm -hmm. uh, but just a journalist for a number of years, tried making it as a playwright, and then you literally answered an ad in a newspaper from the creator of Family Ties, who said that he was willing to read unsolicited writers their manuscripts for shows that he was working on. So that gets you a foot in the door and then pretty much a hop, skip and a jump and you're writing for LA Law. <laughs> it didn't I'm feel like a hop, skip and a jump at the time. <laughs> and it also not? it wasn't an ad, it was an article that had been in the um, Long Island newspaper. It was sort of local boy makes good. Mm -hmm. And in that article he said, I'll read unsolicited manuscripts. So then I, I wrote him a letter because I didn't know that that wasn't how you did it. Mm -hmm. And I asked him if he would read an unsolicited manuscript and he said sure you can send it on to me so um and then I wrote a, a spec script of Family Ties which I subsequently learned you never submit to the show a script for their show um <laughs> because of course it's always going to be wrong because they know more than you do mm -hmm. but he was gracious enough to say well I, uh, if you want to send me something else so then I sent him a different script and mm -hmm. then I moved to California and then um he got another show on the air and within a couple of months I had a job which was, I had no idea was extraordinary until I finished that job and then it took me about two years to get another job. And then it was like, oh, this is how it works. <laughs> so. Okay, so then you, um, you wrote to a, an already established mm -hmm. television writer mm -hmm. just to say, hey, if you're reading unsolicited. So then let's discuss how you and Claire met. There's a little bit of crossover there as well. Yes. So do you want to, let's hear it from Anne first, how she got this interesting message from mm -hmm. some Australian stalker, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> we met on Twitter, actually. Um, and I had just finished up at uh, Outlander and was sort of fishing around for, gee, I wonder what else I can do. And um, I, this tweet came on to my Twitter feed and uh, it was from Claire saying, um, hey, do you think Sam Hewen would be, who'd like to see Sam Hewen play a character in the screen ap adaptation of The Forgotten Rebels of Eureka, my book? And my first thought was, I have no control over Sam Hewen, so I, I can't really <laughs> help you there. But the book sounded really interesting, so I thought, oh, well, it sounds interesting. So I, I responded and just said, what is this? What's this book? Can you tell me about it? Um, and then we kind of went back and forth and back and forth and, and, uh, she said it had been optioned. And at that point I thought, well, then they have a writer. So I said, who's going to write it? Feeling jealous, but okay. <laughs> um, and, uh, she came back and said, I don't know, maybe you. And I thought, wow, well, that would be fun. <laughs> um, and a little bit of be careful what you wish for. Cause it's like, <laughs> oh, okay. So I asked her to send me the book. And at that point, I wasn't sure if she was a stalker or if she was like a legitimate person. So I had her send it to my husband's office. Um, and, uh, and subsequently, she and I were kind of pen pals. And my daughter then said, and it was really fun. We had a lot, we were trading articles and comments and stuff. And my daughter at one point said, Mom, she's grooming you. <laughs> So that, that might have been the point at which I started sending you photos of my dogs. I think so. I think it was, actually. It was. Um, so anyway, that's kind of how we met. And then um, we got, uh, you know, Mark involved and Ruby. And, and there was a lot of kind of back and forth to figure out the, the business side of it. Um, but we did, and now I'm here. But it took a, um, probably about a year and a half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Admit it, Claire, you weren't that naive to say maybe you. You wanted Anne from the very beginning. You didn't really want Sam, maybe only a little bit, wanted <laughs> Sam Hewen. You really wanted Anne, right? Look, Danielle, I didn't think it would anything would come of it. Mm -hmm. um, I really was just amusing myself late one night in the process of writing the book that um, I've just written that's coming out in October. And uh, I was trying to distract myself from the misery of writing um, this book. And, uh, and so as a kind of just, you know, amusing myself really, I sent out, out this tweet, um, who would like to see Sam Hewen play a Scottish miner in the screen adaptation 
of the Forgotten Rebels. And uh, and I put Anne's Twitter handle into it. Um, I put Sam's Twitter handle, but I knew <laughs> Sam wasn't going to get back to me. But I put Anne's Twitter handle in it as well because Anne was my favourite Outlander writer. Um, I was a big fan um, of the show and I was an even bigger fan of, of Anne Kenny's episodes, particularly the wedding episode, mm. um, which there we go. <laughs> um and um, so, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's too much even to call it wishful thinking. I was just mucking around. <laughs> and and uh, so, you know, and then I did that and then I went back to writing my horrible new manuscript. <laughs> and uh, the next morning I got up and I checked my Twitter and, and, and Kenny had gotten <laughs> back to me. And I screamed and I sc- said to my daughter, look at this. And I did a kind of happy dance and, um, and it was just kind of unbelievable. And then once I'd stopped my kind of f- fangirl fever um, <laughs> and remembered that I was Associate Professor Claire Wright from La Trobe <laughs> University. <laughs> Dr Claire Wright to you. I, um, I then wrote back to Anne and, uh, and <laughs> sounded somewhat sane, I you hope. Did, you did. And, uh, and then we started this correspondence. So, yeah, of course, I always hoped that something might come of it, mm. but it was certainly was never an expectation. I do find it hilarious that you, a historian, and Anne, someone who's writing historical dramas at the time, met on Twitter. Yes. I mean, it's, really. It's, it's rather ironic. In the digital yeah. age. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Unbelievable. <laughs> I would also point out, as I have pointed out to you, Anne, if you know anyone who can make this happen, Outlander is a time travel series. So maybe Jamie and Claire need to come to the goldfields and make their <laughs> make their mark. It's not unheard of. It's not, I, as I said, I have no control over Sam and Katrina, so uh, that would have to be a, another. Perhaps you could tweet them again and see if we can get them. Yeah, and still Diana. not responding. <laughs> yeah. Still not responding. Never will. Uh, so, and I'm really curious, when you did read mm-hmm. this, did you have any inkling of this side of Australian history? Did you know any of Australian history, let alone the Eureka Stockade? And just what were your initial thoughts about this rebellion and this 20-minute battle, as we've established, the foundation of Australian democracy? What did you think when you read the book? Um, well, I first of all, Claire's a wonderful writer, and um, it's written in a very – it's really compelling. She has a very funny sense of humour about it, so her commentary and stuff was really entertaining. So it was – in no way dry, um, and the these that these women were there was fascinating, and just trying to imagine, um, you know, what it would be like to get on a boat for three to five months and go to this place where you walk over a hill and it's a bunch of tents and mud. And oh, it's just I can't even imagine. I mean, again, it's a little like Claire falling through time, and she ends up in this place where, yeah, there's all this mud and dirt, and of course. Jamie, but, um, you know, that made things a little bit better. But still, that idea of just changing your life completely was fascinating. And these women were all, you know, every all of them were different. Um, uh, and so that part of it was really interesting to me. I knew nothing of Australian history, I have to say. Sadly, like many Americans, we don't know much about what happens outside our, our world. Um, and, yeah, that it culminates in this little quick battle was – and that that battle – had this huge change in history was really fascinating. And, and again, in a certain way, um, yeah, because at first you think, well, is that anticlimactic? Is it like, you know, all this lead up and all this mm-hmm. stuff and then 20 minutes and it's over? And, you know, somewhere between, you know, what, 12 and 30 people were killed. But then I also thought about Culloden and I thought, you know, that, that was another battle that was over very quickly mm-hmm. and more people were killed, but still, it, it, it. I don't think anybody would know at the time what a huge impact it was going to have. So, um, yeah. So I thought, well, this is this is really cool. This would be very exciting to be a part of. And Claire, given that you do have screen screenwriting background, but what made you realize that you needed to bring somebody else on board? Because I guess the other thing is to make note of when Anne does write this, it's going to be a dramatization, whereas this is very much. Um, historical nonfiction, and you can't really dramatise too much. You have to stick to the facts. So can you talk a little bit about why you knew that somebody else had to come on board, even though you have script writing background? Because as a historian, you can't really make stuff up too much. Yeah, well, it's been a fascinating process for me. Um, 
I was thrilled when Ruby Entertainment asked me whether I would like to be involved in the development um, and, and the writing of the series because it didn't necessarily have to be that way. Um, you, can, you can sell your screen rights uh, to, to your book and walk mm -hmm. away from it and uh, hope that they do a good job and say the book is the book and the television product mm -hmm. is, is something else. Uh, but I, I did have uh, screenwriting background and I was really inv interested in being involved in it. Uh, my, my screen credits were documentaries and so much more in keeping with the sort of history I already wrote, which is evidence-based um, history. And, but I, I really wanted to have a crack at it because I wanted to see what it would be like to be able to stretch my wings mm -hmm. further than, than historical writing allows you to. Um, as you suggest, I can't make stuff up. If I, if I know that a character was at A and then they were at C, but I don't know how they got, went through B to get there, I can't make B up. Um, I can potentially speculate as long as I let my audience know that that's what I'm doing but um, but no matter how that how good that story would sound to make them go through B to get to C I can't um, so there's always that kind of um, there's sort of shackles that are that feel like they're on when when you're writing history if you have a fertile imagination um, <laughs> as I think I do um, but uh, um, it, it, I never contemplated writing the whole thing myself, and not just because um, I haven't got that, that, that skill base, but also because I think it's really important to have uh, an, an outsider mm -hmm. come to this story. Uh, the Eureka Stockade is really familiar to us. I mean, one of the, the most common comments I get from readers about the Forgotten Rebels of Eureka, and it's been out for five years now, so I've, there's been a few, uh, they say, you know, it, it's, um, it's kind of unsettling because it's a story they thought they knew so well, and yet they read this book and realise they didn't know anything at all, really. So they, it makes them wonder how many other stories that they thought they knew mm -hmm. they've also only gotten a partial picture of. But I think that it's important to have an outsider's perspective because it brings that fresh sense of what's meaningful, what's significant, what's important, particularly from a dramatic point of view, yeah. not necessarily from a nationalistic or a mm -hmm. jingoistic or a patriotic or a political. You know, Eureka is an event that has been highly politicised mm -hmm. um, over the last 160 years. You just have to look at current debates about the use of the Eureka flag. I was going to say, yeah. To, to know that um, this is an ancient history, it's not all done. These, these, these are stories that people are still very invested in. So I think having somebody who comes from outside and, and particularly somebody with the insightfulness and, and sensitivity of Anne means that we'll just get a much richer version of this story. Mm -hmm. And I also think that it's important because, as Anne was, <coughs> was suggesting, these people, like Claire, were all strangers in a strange land. Mm -hmm. um, it's like they'd all drop through the stones, 100,000 of them, um, mm -hmm by 1854. So by, but from 1851 to 1854, the, the, the population of Victoria quadrupled. And these people had come from everywhere, mm -hmm. from France and Italy and Germany and England and Scotland and Ireland and in America. And, and so they were all experiencing this land from an outsider's mm -hmm. point of view, except for the Waterung people of Ballarat who were already there. And we have a Waterung character as well. So I think that that sense of, um, uh, you know, that there's no, there aren't any Australians in this story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, w this is a, a, the quintessential Australian story now, but in 1854, there weren't Australians there. That u the Eureka flag, when it was flown on the 3rd of December, it wasn't called the Eureka flag then, it was called the Australian flag, and it was the first time that an Australian flag mm -hmm. had been flown with the Southern Cross as the symbol that united this polyglot people from all over the mm -hmm. world. So I really think that's what um, Anne brings to this story is, um, is, is a freshness that we'll have Australian writers on board, obviously, mm -hmm. of course. Um, it's not um, going to be a closed shop for international writers. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I think that um, we're really lucky to have Anne.
Yeah, it is. It's interesting that we think of multicultural as a modern word, but actually it was already embodied in even the Eureka Stockade and the Eureka Rebellion and everything. They didn't use the the word multicultural, they used the word cosmopolitan Cosmopolitan. at the time, Mm. which now is a sexy drink. Mm. But (laughs) (laughs) Um, One of the things too, when I read the book, and Claire and I have talked about this a little bit also, is that... um, you know, when it happened, it isn't like the next day, whoo, everything changed and everything was good. And a, a lot of these people, um, again, as you probably all know, did not get rich. Mm-hmm. Most of them didn't. Mm-hmm. So I, I was saying to her, there was a point at which when I'm reading the book, I'm thinking, wow, this is a sack of woe. I just don't know where, because <laughs> you have to have some, I want some kind of you know, redemption. And that's, I think, also when you get into their personal lives and what they're accomplishing personally and Mm. the people they're meeting. Um, But also there's a beautiful, beautiful quote at the end where um, it's, is it Martha that says it? No, uh, Clara Seacamp. Right, who says the, and I hope I'm going to get this Mm -hmm. wrong, the most recent immigrant is the first first, uh, Australian, is the next Mm -hmm. Australian. The idea that all these Mm -hmm. people who came from all these disparate places and obviously came for a reason, um, in part, I think, because they were dissatisfied with their life there. And that idea of inclusion, that idea of like, we're all here starting something new together, um, was very mm, uplifting to me. And I thought, okay, if we can sort of drive toward that, I think that we'll be, we'll be okay. Mm-hmm. And also this idea of going and pursuing your dreams and trying to make your fortune, that's been repeated across history. I mean, what is Silicon Valley but a modern day yes. gold field, you know, and, you know, in in the back in the day, the miners were living in tents. Well, how many people in Silicon Valley have ended up, you know, in, in parents' garages? <laughs> and it's the same thing. It's, yes. it's repeating human history. It's we all go out and we seek our fortune and we try to make our lives better for us and our families. Mm-hmm. It's really fascinating. Mm-hmm. And given that you have pointed out that Anne clearly is very insightful to this history, but also just human development and hearts. Mm. I would love to now play some Outlander preview clips. (laughs) Not for any reason, just because. (laughs) We can do the first episode if you really want. No, it's okay. (laughs) I want to play you a couple of... Well, we'll we'll play them first and then we'll discuss. Hopefully this works. Somebody's given me a clicker. I don't know if this is going to be a good idea or not. Sixteenth of April, he said. That's when history records the battle. Three days from now. We will trap the British between us. Surprise attack. Well then, gentlemen, it's decided. I am prepared to keep my promise. To defeat our enemy. Once and for all. Episode 208 is called The Fox's Lair, and it was written by Anne Kinney. We called this episode The Fox's Lair because it takes place at the home of Lord Lovett, and he is known as the Old Fox. There are a couple of big differences between how it's told in the book and how it's told in the show. Leary is not in the story in the book. Leary? Did the Laird not tell you I was with him? No. And because of something that's going to happen down the line, we really felt that we needed to redeem her a little bit, or it was going to make what happens down the line just so implausible. I think this is one that it'll be interesting to see how the fans react. And I suppose the biggest difference that we tried to keep into the last minute was that the real Lord Lovett had wooden teeth. The problem is it would be hard for the actor to speak, even if we put prosthetics in, obviously they wouldn't really be wooden teeth. So we had to let that one go. I think my favorite moment is probably Jamie with the baby. We had two little girls that we were alternating, which is always fun when you're on the set and you think, oh, this one's gonna work. It was a very emotional uh, scene just watching it. Also, of course, seeing Sam hold a baby was, you know, catnip. That was really fun to watch. (laughs) So I wanted to show those two. One, because I just wanted to point out that I rapidly realized I had been pronouncing Leary's name wrong when I was reading the books for all those years. I was calling her Lahori. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that was probably intentional, but yeah. I could be wrong. Okay, good. <laughs> I wanted to point out those two episodes, which was uh, The Hail Mary and The Fox's Lair. I think because in The Hail Mary, you're doing something very tricky, which is you are contextualizing the period in which Outlander is set, which is the lead up to the Battle of Culloden and the, the Jacobite uprising and everything. You're also 
letting viewers and some characters know that Claire knows how it turns out and what they're trying to change. So I find it really interesting that you were inserting a lot of history into that. But then also uh, the Fox's Lair, I found it really interesting that you adapted what was in the book to make it work for screen. So Leary, like you said, you needed to redeem the character, knowing that she would come back eventually, that she needed a moment of redemption given that she's so awful. (laughs) <laughs> so I want to talk about, first of all, how interesting it is, I think, that with Outlander, you're taking fiction and inserting a bit of history context into it. Mm-hmm. And in this time around, <coughs> you have the historical context and now you're going to be inserting fictional characters into it. Mm-hmm. So can you talk a little bit about how you're playing around with that in your mind with the Forgotten Rebels of Eureka? And I think you've already said that a few characters maybe doubled up yes. for the purposes of, as we've just seen, that has to happen sometimes on screen. So can you mm-hmm. talk a little bit about that? Um I think one of the things that uh, Claire and I talked about a lot was um, usually when I start writing something, um, a script, the first question I ask myself is, what does this character want? Um, Because I need to know that. And then the story is going to be, what are they going to do to get it? And do they or don't they get it? Um, And then the next question is, what do the other characters want that's going to cause conflict? Um, And it can't just be... I want to get up out of this chair and Claire wants me to sit down because that's a boring conflict. So it would be, I want to get out of this chair and Claire wants to get in the chair. So we're trying to, I mean, well, if you, you, that would actually not be a conflict because I would want to get out of the chair. But each person <laughs> has to have a positive want to, to put them in conflict mm-hmm. with each other. So I think that's something that mm-hmm. with this, I have to be, we have to really go through and say, what do each of these women want in a in the larger arc and then also in each episode what smaller thing do they want and and who are they in conflict with in order to get that and certainly we have stuff from history to tell us about that but we're going to have to put some Mm -hmm. of that aside Mm -hmm. and and just look at them as human beings and say okay who what what is this what does this character want and it's been great because working with claire again she's very flexible um in terms of Um, being able to play with the characters. Mm. A lot of times when you work with um, technical advisors on things, it's challenging because you say, well, I I really need this uh, button to explode. Could that ever happen? And they say, no, a button would never explode. (laughs) And then you get that one technical advisor that says, well, maybe if it had dynamite in it. And you think, (laughs) okay, my button has dynamite. This is totally going to work. So, uh, but you've been great about trying to, you know, uh, manipulate it a little bit. Mm. Um, So I think that that's the difference. And yes, with like the Fox's Lair, um, Simon Lovett is a real character. Um, And I have to say, again, Diana Gabaldon did a ton of of research. So we had that to start with. Um, And and then I read a book about him who is a fascinating character. Um, and I think it, it may be similarly similar with um, Rebels in that some of these characters are so interesting in the world, but you have mm-hmm. to just kind of pick and choose because they'll overtake the thing. You, mm-hmm. can't, you can't tell that whole story. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that'll, it's, it's kind of going at it a little bit differently than, than we did with Outlander. Mm-hmm. I think you were also talking before, as you do, mm-hmm. about how there's room for sex. In an adaptation of The Forgotten Rebels of Eureka. For a historical reason, Claire, if you can back me up, there is historical reason Mm -hmm. to maybe have a little bit of sexy times in an adaptation. Please don't make me sound like a weirdo. Please back me up. (laughs) (laughs) What are you talking about, You're you're coming from a strong evidence base Mm -hmm. there, Danielle. Um, There is lots of room for sex in um, any screen adaptation of Rebels. Mm -hmm. Um, Not only because it makes for good drama... um, going on Anne's um, principle of what do people want, Uh, but also because this was a period of time where the people in Ballarat were actually having a lot of sex. And um, there was a baby boom um, going on at the time, um, which I can demonstrate through the birth, deaths and marriage records, mostly births, Mm -hmm. um, skyrocketing at Mm -hmm. at this particular point in time. I mean, this was a young population, an immigrant population. The average age of people um, in Ballarat in 1854 was 22. Um, 80% of the population was under 40. Uh, 40% was under 20. So you've got a fair mm. idea of what the, mm. um, the, the, the other 40% what, were doing. What humans are going to be doing. In, yep. in their tents in candlelight. And you know, this was a tent city. They were living under mm-hmm. canvas. Um, it was an upside-down 
period of time, everything's in flux. Um, gender roles, mm -hmm. um, social roles, everything is up in the air, up for grabs. And it's cold, cold in Ballarat, Ballarat <laughs> thank you. Um, it is in June and July as we did, and August as we just <laughs> experienced last week. Um, it's so also that there was, you know, there were French, there were there were Irish, there were Italian, there were Scottish. You throw those accents at me, I'm I'm going to believe yeah, it. Yeah, you're going to you're going to you're going to be there. It. So so um, there there's very good reason for there to be lots of um, <laughs> sexy times. But uh, the, the thing for me, um, I'm thinking about listening to your talk and that has been really interesting when you're talking about, you know, what do characters want, uh, what do their adversaries want, why, where is the, con the conflict come mm -hmm. from? That springs back to what I was saying before about uh, the, the having now to invent what there is right. no documentation for. Because women in the 19th century didn't write about their inner lives. Um, that when they wrote diaries and, and journals and letters home, they're more reportage. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the idea that you would spill out your inner yearnings to a journal um, or to Oprah mm -hmm. or to the person um, <laughs> on the tram <laughs> or on the phone and everybody knows what's mm -hmm. going on inside you or every minute of the day, that's a completely modern concept. Mm -hmm. So to be able to create an inner life for right. characters just does require motiv that... that, that um, that imagination but you can have a sense of and we've talked a lot about this mm -hmm. you know what is the difference between each character what is their background you know how does an Irish Protestant girl from um, who is coming out in 1854 differ from an Anglo-Irish girl coming out mm -hmm. because where has she come from and, and what have been the constraints on her life beforehand mm -hmm. um, and interestingly we've also talked a lot about the male characters in some ways we've talked more about them yeah. and and this was something that was unexpected for me uh, in terms of our workshopping because you've been really strong on it's got to make if, if you if we're going to look at this from a female perspective look at this story from a female perspective, we have to understand what these women see in these blokes. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, they're not whole characters either. Right. So we've spent a lot of time breaking down what are the motivations, right. what are the characteristics, what's the psychology of the fellas that are in our right. story. Um, and even more so, some of the most challenging moments have been about the baddies. Right. Mm -hmm. um, because there's some obvious baddies in the story. But you've been really strong on, and this has been fantastic for my learning curve, Anne, about you can't just have a psycho. Right. Like, no. he's got to be a psycho for a reason. Yeah. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, even Blackjack, who is our, mm -hmm. you know, Outlander's psycho, right. uh, has, has got that deep sort of psychological base that you worked very hard on. Yeah. So we've, we've spent a lot of time working out um, what's motivating those baddies. Right. And I think, too, even though, <coughs> excuse me, we, we want to have a lot of sex, one of the things that I certainly learned from Outlander um, is that you just don't want people just boinking like rabbits because that's not very interesting after a while. I mean, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's so fantastic about the Outlander books before, I, you know, before we did the show is... Um, is longing, is desire, is... I mean, I think one of the reasons that the wedding episode, both in the book and on the show, mm -hmm. works so well is because it took... In the show, that was a seventh episode. Mm -hmm. So it, so often, I, I used to laugh on other shows that I would, would work on, if you had a couple that were going to get together, it was meet, eat, sleep. <laughs> you know, she's like, hi, let's have dinner, and now we're in bed. <laughs> um and I think that that's something that, that we really want to look at, too, is to, to make these, you know, and, and it'll be great because we're dealing with a population, even though they were having a lot of sex, just culturally, you know, you weren't just jumping into bed together. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a wooing and a courting. And um, I, I always think of a friend of mine um, wrote a line in a script that's always been my favorite and a great way, I think, to describe that desire. And that is that we had two characters um, that we're going to get together. It was the first time, uh, and, and they'd been kind of circling each other, and there's the moment where um, they, they're just going to kiss, and she stops and says, this is my favorite part, and he says, what? And she says, 
the moment right before you kiss for the first time. And he says, well, how long um, do you want that to last? And she says, as long as I can stand it. <laughs> and I, I love that. I think that's what you go for when you want those, you know, and that's certainly, I think, what we want to do with this is to really make you love these characters and understand them and feel that desire. Um, and then you get the satisfaction. Yes, to all of that. <laughs> uh, I'm now going to hopefully press this button again and it's going to bring up some images that prove how cold it was in Ballarat, number one, <laughs> because you were there quite recently. Yay! Oh, yeah. Let's talk about the research that you did because I also want to point out, um, and particularly for you, researching Outlander about the Jacobite rising of, uprising of 1745, the Battle, the battle of Culloden, but you go to those places now and it's just a field. Yeah. And there's one or two cans that are commemorating the clans that died and pretty much that culture died off in Scotland. But you go to those places and it's just an open field. Mm -hmm. So talk about maybe what it was like to go to the Victorian goldfields and Sovereign Hill and everything, which is sort of like a historic amusement park mm -hmm. for the way that they recreate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the way that they represent, I mean, there's a lot structurally that's been built that's not maybe um, was actually there, but they've recreated it. There's uh, people walking around in the older ti olden timey clothes. You can get photos taken if you want, looking like a miner. Um, I guess we it's didn't. also you no. didn't. Oh, we did somebody not. did ask me if you had a photo of that that you mm -mm. could show us. No, but we, we did don't. make a candle, and we bowled. <laughs> we bowled. I was impressed. Oh. They had Is that part of the sexy alleys. times? Oh, no. Oh, okay. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, we got to get that in there. It, it must be similar, though, as an American to the American Revolutionary War and Civil War, where there's still a lot of places that are historically, um, you know, preserved and everything. Mm -hmm. But what was it like, the difference between researching for Outlander, like I said, where these places where all these battles took place with all these hundreds and thousands of people dying are just open fields versus going and seeing a tent at Sovereign Hill and, and the gold fields? What was it like having that sort of tangible connection? And we can go through the images as well. This is you standing underneath strategically rebel. Mm-hmm. That's at the Eureka Centre, mm -hmm. where the uh, Eureka flag is currently housed. And um, up till very recently, it was called the mm. Museum of Australian Democracy at Eureka. So all of those words relate to the concept of democracy in some way. And that's Mark Bruce, our that's producer. Mark. Do you want to wave, Mark, just to say that you are here? Hi, Mark. There he is. Okay. A real person. Oh, a tent where the sexy times can happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And hopefully the sexy time is not going to be with somebody dressed like that, which is <laughs> really disturbing. And I'm sorry. They're quite big tents, though, aren't they? I was, uh, you know, yeah. I, I was thinking of the, the two-man tent, which is really more of a one-man tent when you go on school camp. They're quite big. Wow. Well, and also they have these um, chimneys, a lot of them, behind them, which I thought really? was really interesting, not to mention really dangerous. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so there was a cozy quality to them. I, I also think that's, that's interesting because people, we're nesters, I think. And so even in that tent, you want it to be homey somehow. So that was really interesting to see how people had put things, mm -hmm. um, or you know, the people they were uh, imagining had put things together. Um, I will say full disclosure, I had not, I've never been to Culloden. So some of the places that are in mm -hmm. the show, that's production designers mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Um, but, but one of the things we did there was to look at the Eureka flag. Is that, that's not at Sovereign Hill. Oh, actually. This is just, this is you two Eureka. looking very cute yes. and very rugged up. It was we were cold trying there, to figure right? out, are we watching like, is the stagecoach going to come from the sky? I'm not sure <laughs> what we were doing there. Not only that, but we have our hands and our feet almost exactly the same. Like we're going to break into some kind of a dance routine. I don't, I don't know what that was. Again, just the, the gorgeousness of those buildings in the background as well. You can imagine the set's going to be quite fun. Yeah, I think so. The other thing that struck me about Sovereign Hill the that I thought was so interesting is they said one of the challenges is to keep the buildings looking new mm. because it was all oh, new. Of course, yeah. Which I, I, you know, again, you see that it's old timey. You think, of course, everything's <laughs> going to be kind of falling apart and mm. whatever because it's old, but it, mm. it wasn't old then. So... I thought that was pretty interesting. And of course, this is a uh, this streetscape that we're standing on here is a period that's slightly later than than Eureka. So, mm -hmm. um, 1854 is, and particularly down on the diggings, is all tents up in the township. There are a few mm -hmm. shops that have started to be built like this, mm -hmm. um, but very simple timber construction. So this is the 
this is yeah. a slightly later time. Because mm-hmm. when I see this as well, it, it gives me Deadwood vibes, mm-hmm. which is the television mm-hmm. series Deadwood, which is, if you haven't seen it, um, if you're Outlander fans, you probably enjoy it as well, historic drama. It's really good. That's yeah. kind of giving me those sort of vibes. And, and we've talked a lot about Deadwood. Uh, it, it's certainly a model for us. Mm-hmm. Um, wh- one of the things that we have to be careful of is, particularly for international audiences, to, to make the immediate parallel between, oh, you know, f- American frontier mm. um, mining town yeah. uh, to Australian frontier mining town because they were very different. We had British law and they mm-hmm. had Yankee law, which was no law. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it was mm-hmm. something that, that people on the um, Victorian goldfields, that the authorities were very frightened of, the idea of Yankee yeah. law or lynch law, it was mm-hmm. often called, the idea that you just take some mm-hmm. up and string them from a tree or yeah. in Deadwood just go and throw them to the pigs. Mm-hmm. And um, so that kind of image that mm-hmm. people might have in their heads mm-hmm. is quite different from the, the social and political environment um, of the Ballarat diggings. And yeah. we'll have to make those mm-hmm. distinctions. I think we might have missed one, but you also saw the original flag, yes. which was probably stitched by women, mm-hmm. interestingly. Mm-hmm. So seeing all of that, did, did it did it get your ideas churning? Did you instantly start sparking with ideas and talking to Claire about what if, what if, what if? Um, I, I would say it's uh, it was really helpful sort of to have it in my head. And again, she's been kidding me because everybody we talk to, I say, how did they know where to dig? Like... <laughs> Was and there some, obsessed with I this am idea. Obsessed with this idea. <laughs> You're out in this big place, and and you get eight. It's eight by eight, right? Mm. And how how do you know where to dig? It's like, is there some kind of weird, you know, the moon, you know, like in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, the moon <laughs> shines through a thing, and you know it's that place. And everybody keeps saying, well, you just dug, you just yeah. dug. So I guess I'm gonna have to let go of that. I don't know what. But um, I think for me, again, I start always with character so it's really great to have those images and places Mm -hmm. to put in my head but I'm it's going to be more about kind of stepping back and saying okay Mm -hmm. now that I have an idea of who you know uh, Mary is or Maggie or Ellen and then I can imagine them in that place so I think it'll be very helpful at that point. Well, given that this is about the women of Eureka, let mm-hmm. me just run through a few characters. And I've obviously just picked out some of my favourites. But by all means, if there's someone else that you want to mention. Mm-hmm. But Sarah Hanma, who mm-hmm. ran the Adelphi Theatre, who was the central, who, that was central to cultural life in the community. Mm-hmm. Catherine Bentley, who lost her hotel in the riots, but was also a bit of a character with her own sort of spoiler-filled story. Uh, Clara Seacamp, who became the editor of the Ballarat Times in 1855 and who published Ellen F. Young, the Ballarat poet. And I think... From a, a purely sort of cinematic standpoint, one of my favourite characters is an unnamed one, an unknown one, mm-hmm. which happens in the beginning. It's this funeral procession with a, a coffin that's laced with white trim. And uh, a journalist at the time said that is the coffin of a woman who leapt in front of her digger husband to try and save his life and was butchered by a trooper. And we don't know who she was, mm-hmm. which is kind of what got you also interested in, in finding out who these women were because they were clearly there. Their blood was spilt on the, on the fields. So let's talk a little bit about whose story do you follow? Is this going to be like a Claire with, with one viewpoint or is the strength of this story that there are so many women to, to show to us that our foundational history is collectively many women? Mm-hmm. How, do you, how do you choose whose story gets told? Well, we've gone back and forwards mm-hmm. over this one um, <laughs> the, uh, about how to structure it and we... we um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing a pilot <laughs> episode to see where, where the ball drops on this one. But we've, uh, we've talked about many structures and mm-hmm. there is a kind of outlander structure where there's mm-hmm. a central character like Claire and you're mm-hmm. seeing everything through her point of view. Mm-hmm. There's more of a kind of orange is a new black structure mm-hmm. uh, where you have a sort of central character like Piper, mm-hmm. uh, but you have um, a large ensemble cast and each one of those mm-hmm. women has their own backstory revealed. Or like vignettes. Mm-hmm. within an episode mm-hmm. even, yeah. So all those characters kind of get deeper and you get more mm-hmm. of a sense of, of who each of them are. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's a kind of using an, an uh, Australian cultural touch point, there's more of a, a slap um, a, um, yeah. structure where mm-hmm. every where you've got one single incident and then every character has a completely mm-hmm. different perspective mm-hmm. on that, you know, the kind of the Rashomon idea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so... Um, 
we we have created, in a sense, our central character, mm -hmm. uh, um, who is going to be this American woman, um, and that's she is actually a real character. She was mm -hmm. at Eureka, but she's actually probably the person that I know least about. Mm -hmm. She plays an important role, but I, mm -hmm. she's not the woman in the box. Um, but she she's the one I know least about, and in some ways, that's what allows us to invest her with whatever we want her to yeah. be. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be the central woman, but do either of you have particular favourites who you just sort of clung to when you heard their story? Um, well, I really like Clara Seacamp, although we're gonna, mm -hmm. she will be a composite mm -hmm. character. Um, mm -hmm. And and S Celeste, is that her name? Celeste um, de Chabillon. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, so we're going to kind of mush her together, um, which I think will be really fun. Um, Ellen is really an influential character, although mm -hmm. she's been so far the hardest one for me to get my arms around just because when I think poet and she's the poetess, I just keep <laughs> imagining somebody kind of floating around in a diaphanous <laughs> dress, and that's not obviously what's happening. Mm -hmm. So... She'll take a little, I think it'd be a little challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and I love uh, Catherine Bentley, I actually really like. I like She's Catherine Bentley mm -hmm. because she, um, y you know, I just, we're imagining her as being extremely, really ambitious. She comes here and she decides, I'm going to get this hotel built. And and she, she and her husband very quickly build this amazing hotel it's you know all kinds of beautiful things in it and they've imported all this stuff mm -hmm. and what in a couple of months it's burned down mm -hmm. and then her life just goes in the dumper <laughs> i mean she really wow um and again it's we're all in such a preliminary stage but uh, you know first thought theater as we're talking mm -hmm. about she's a character that i think will be easy to to hate Mm -hmm. And I think it'll be interesting th to take somebody through that. And initially you might feel like, yeah, you got what you deserved. But then as you see what happens to her, you start to have a lot of empathy for mm -hmm. her and think, wow, enough, enough. She's had enough. It, w it was really one of the very interesting things in, in workshopping all of this is also to be very clear in our minds that just because we're foregrounding these women's experiences and it's a kind of... Uh, form of female gaze or which has a very mm -hmm. um, contemporary zeitgeisty feminist edge mm -hmm. to it it doesn't mean that all the women are nice mm -mm. Um, it doesn't mean that all their motives are pure mm -hmm. it doesn't mean no. that what they do their deeds are all good and uh, and so that's been it makes it a lot more fun mm -hmm. when they're not that when the characters themselves are not kind of ciphers to a, a modern political sensibility. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the label strong female protagonist is my most hated because it's mm -hmm. so one note and and women are, are just human beings who have a myriad of, of you know good qualities and bad qualities. And I actually think Claire in Outlander is not always perfect. Sometimes she did things that made me yell at the screen. Yeah. Sometimes she's way too bullheaded and too rash um, and, and gets herself into these situations where you think, why did you open your mouth? Um, so that Jamie could come through the window and say, get your hands off my wife. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> that's why. It makes sense now. But I hate the term strong female protagonist because I think that's not true. Women are more interesting when they're complicated, when they're Absolutely. mean, when they're nasty, when they've got their own motivations and they're out for themselves. That's way more interesting than just mm. strength. Yeah, absolutely. The, again, that comes back to, you know, uh, yeah, one woman. We're all different. Mm -hmm. Hello, there's a surprise. <laughs> um, and so to be able to write really full characters for all these different women is will be really fun. I think yeah. we'll have a really good time with that. Uh, speaking of women being different, which may come as a shock to, well, probably no one in this room, mm -hmm. um, I did have a question here from a young budding filmmaker called Brayden who pointed out that similar to Outlander, which was helmed by Ronald D. Moore, mm -hmm. but he clearly had um, a very clear objective of bringing women into the writer's room, having women directors, and just making them part of the behind the scenes because mm -hmm. he clearly saw that Outlander as a romance series meant a lot to female readers in particular. And similar here, Ruby Entertainment is you're working with male producers. So let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk about has there been a discussion about, hey, if you're going to do a series about the erasure of women from Australian history, they may have to be behind the scenes a little bit. Has that been discussed that you would like? I mean, the fact that the two of you are at the helm as well is probably bodes well, but let's discuss that, that you do have to sort of make a stand and say, hey, females uh, writing the scripts and directing on occasion. It, it makes a big difference. I, I think, um, you know, people ask me about the wedding episode in particular <clears throat> and this notion of the female gaze. I don't remember ever being 
um, in the room and talking about that specifically. It wasn't a conscious sort of, okay, we have to be sure. But, you know, when you are on the set and we were shooting that and it was, we were basing it on Diana Gabaldon's books. So there's a woman. Um, we have Anna Forster, who's directing it. Um, I wrote it. Meryl Davis, who was a big mover and shaker behind a lot of that mm -hmm. stuff, who's Ron's partner. Mm -hmm. um, we're the ones on the set. And Katrina. So, you know, there are those moments. I can remember a moment, you know, when she's walking around um, Jamie that, that we're sitting there going, wow, what would I like to touch? What would <laughs> I like to see? And said to her, hey, why don't you drag your hand across his ass, you know? Um, and she, she did. And, I mean, it was part of that. So I think those things just happened organically because there were women making those choices. Mm -hmm. It, and again, nobody sat down and said, we want to see what women want to see. Mm -hmm. We were there. We just said, no, okay. And we had the um, uh, freedom to do that. Uh, you know, there are other times mm -hmm. when you, you know, you're there and, you know, you think, well, that's what I'd like to do. But I know this guy back here is not going to want that. So we're going to do it a different way. Or how the script is written is doesn't lend itself to that sort of thing. So, um, yeah. It makes a difference. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, that episode has been lauded as stellar television and not just because it's smutty but because it's actually genuinely brilliantly well done mm -hmm. there is build up there is female gaze you don't often see that on television if ever yes i mean it makes a difference when there is more than one woman in the room yeah oh, and a huge difference and yeah. i think um you know you mentioned that ruby entertainment is is uh run by two male producers uh, which is true <laughs> uh but you know, men aren't all bad guys, no, and right. certainly mm -hmm. the men at Ruby Entertainment aren't. Uh, no. Mark Ruse is the um, the most collaborative person I think I've ever mm -hmm. worked with, and I, I actually, after the days that he and I spent uh, workshopping together um, and working up a treatment before Anne came, we had already kind of worked out ha um, a narrative arc for our eight mm -hmm. episodes and already broken down characters, mm -hmm. and so that we had mm -hmm. something to discuss with Anne. Nothing was set in stone. It, it, um, it everything was up for grabs but we had done a lot of the conceptual yep. work before mm -hmm. Anne um, got here and I after the couple of days of that I remember saying to my husband the next morning I don't think I have ever been in a room with another man who listens to a woman <laughs> in quite the same way mm -hmm. as Mark does who doesn't like it Mark will come up with an idea and then I'd say yeah that's really good but but what if we did it this way and he'd go mm -hmm. yeah no no that's a much better idea and then not claim it as his own idea. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, you know, and that just became a kind of organic yeah. part of the way that we worked together. Mm -hmm. So I feel very, um, I feel extremely trusting mm -hmm. um, of those fellas. And I, and I also know that they understand um, and appreciate that, that, that this idea also of having women in the room is an industrial issue as much mm -hmm. as is mm -hmm. a creative issue. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that there is um, already some will to have women as the heads of all of the departments um, in, in the production. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly, they know, that's certainly possible in terms of the talent pool in yeah. Australia of cinematographers and, and production designers and musical directors and producers and writers and directors. Uh, the, the, the woman who directed um, The Secret River, Dana mm -hmm. Reed is fantastic talent. Mm -hmm. She's just directed two of the episodes in the second series of Handmaid's Tale, which were wonderful and oh. inc incredible Australian director. So, um, so there are, you know, mm -hmm. um, men of good conscience. Um, we might <laughs> want to call them yeah. champions of change. Yeah. And uh, they're there and I feel very fortunate to be working with them. It's mm -hmm. clearly why you chose Ruby Entertainment to tell this story. And it's also, as you've already said, that you were surprised in discussions with Anne that the male characters have been a big consideration for you, considering that you were very much con um, concerned with talking about women who haven't had their stories told. Mm. But of course there's men in Eureka. And I, I'd, always, I'd always said way before um, a television series was, um, was uh, a glimmer in anybody's eye that the thing about putting women back into the Eureka story was that it restored the humanity to the men in the story. Yeah. It's not about chucking those men yeah. out um, or saying that they're in irrelevant or insignificant or not as important mm -hmm. as people have made them out to be. Mm -hmm. It's actually about saying, well, if you put the women who were actually there back in the story, those men are no longer just miners in military, those, mm -hmm. you know, black and white, polaric um, antagonists. Mm -hmm. 
all of them are now husbands and fathers and brothers and sons and they have relationships to each other and mm -hmm. to these women and suddenly it actually makes a lot more sense why they were fighting for their rights mm -hmm. in Ballarat mm -hmm. so that political rights aren't just a kind of empty concept mm -hmm. um, some sort of ideological uh, manifesto that they're pursuing but they're they're actually uh, the means by which these men can change their daily lives and the situation of their daily lives is they're watching their wives die in childbirth, they can't feed their families, they're feeling impotent, they're feeling enraged and aggrieved because they were sold a pup, they were told they were going to be able to come out here and make gold and be masters of their own domain. And here they are, actually, their women are the breadwinners because mm -hmm. they're the ones taking in washing and washing and, and selling sly grog out of their tents and making something while they're not finding gold. So it's actually much more interesting for everybody mm -hmm. involved if you tell the full story in all of its glorious inclusivity, inclusivity it, and diversity. It again harks back to how this is very much the modern day. It's going to take everyone to make change, to make proper changes for progress for everyone. Yeah much as the rebellion wouldn't have happened without everyone working together. It, mm -hmm. it couldn't have just been one group of people. Really fascinating. And having now discussed the characters, and I know that it starts with characters for you, Anne, mm -hmm. if we can go a little bit bigger into themes. I mean, it sounds a little bit superficial to say between Outlander and the Forgotten Rebels of Eureka, oh, well, they're both historic dramas. Mm -hmm. But actually the thread, the linchpin on both of them is rebellion. Mm -hmm. It is uh, the first few stories of Outlander is the Jacobite uprising. Uh, people fighting back and in Eureka it's people fighting back it's the birth of democracy and interestingly Claire this is kind of a lodestone for you as a historian mm. because you have um, the Forgotten Rebels of Eureka is now the first in what's being called the democracy trilogy coming from you and your new book out with text publishing coming out on October 1st write that down, is mm. You Daughters of Freedom, which is about the white women's Australian suffrage movement here, which again, the linchpin for that is rebellion, is people rising up. Is this what ties the two together for you? And is this also why these stories are relevant to the here and now, in our political climate as well? And you've already mentioned the significance of the, of the Eureka flag, even now in our politics, it's still a combustible topic. Some don't want it being waved by unions because it's too it's too close to rebellion again. So can you talk a little bit about how this is a common thread for you both? Do you want to take that? <laughs> huge question. Yeah, it is a huge question. Um, well, again, from a dramatic point of view, right off you've got conflict. So that, that helps. And we've talked a little bit about this whole notion of theme and that kind of thing. And again, I generally, um, I, I don't think about themes when I'm writing for the most part I'm writing I'm interested in the characters and why they're behaving the way they are and on a, on a much more micro level and I have to trust that the reason I'm making the choices I'm making there's an organic theme to it that I'm making this choice and not that choice but I don't think about it that way and I find that really restrictive and kind of contrived when I when I go at it like that um, uh, something that I read talked about don't try to create and analyze at the same time because they're two different functions. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, again, I think the rebellion piece of it uh, definitely is, is because of the conflict. To be perfectly honest with you, I loved Outlander and went to Outlander not because of the rebellion but because this amazing relationship between Jamie and Claire. Um, and I just want to say, I think a, a little uh, the conversation about the men I, I think it's um, it tells you a lot about your in this case your female characters when when you are you have strong male characters around them and I think that one of the things that we did in the show on Outlander that is Diana didn't do as much in the book was we really tried to build a, a more appealing character for Frank because Frank in the mm -hmm. books, um, y you know, when she'd say, I've got to get back to Frank, party is like, really? Because <laughs> really? Um, and so we really wanted to make it more of a conflict so that you really did feel like, mm -hmm. wow, she's, I know why she's trying to get back there. And, and uh, um, I think that that's why we want to make our male characters mm -hmm. strong too, because you really want to feel it, it, it only... Um, brings up the, the female characters or if you're writing a show about men and you have strong female characters around him it just it makes everybody more interesting mm. and more compelling i think mm. Mm. democracy 
<laughs> Mowage. No. Um, <laughs> democracy is uh, it's a concept that fascinates me. Um, mm-hmm. As as we all know, it's um, there's not a great lot of faith that's put in it um, at the moment, and particularly by younger generations. Mm-hmm. Um, our politicians don't help that situation at all. But it's very alarming when you get surveys and studies that show how few people um, believe it's the best model model of politically organising a society. Um, And I think it's really important to show how very much it meant to people Mm -hmm. in the past Mm -hmm. to fight for democracy and to be a part of the governments that made the laws that govern daily lives. Mm -hmm. And that's what Eureka was about. Uh, it, it wasn't a revolution, um, despite what Peter Fitzsimon says. <laughs> Love you, Peter. Um, but I- I- if anything, it was a sociological revolution. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a political one. Nobody wanted to over- t- overthrow the government. Mm-hmm. Nobody wanted to create a new political system. These people wanted to have a part of the si- be a part of the system, mm-hmm. have the opportunity, the same opportunity to... Um, to make change in their daily lives. They, they believed that in the concept of no taxation without representation. The licensing fee that they were opposed to was a form of taxation, an, an unequal one, um, and not a progressive tax. It was a poll tax. They couldn't change that because they didn't have a vote. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They fought for that vote, for that, for that right mm-hmm. to be heard, for their voices to be heard. And, and, and some women and some men also fought at the time for the right for women's voices to be heard too. Um, uh, what came out of Eureka was that the system was changed to allow them in. And once they were in, they were happy with that. Um, and, and everybody pretty much went about their daily lives, which meant making money, having their babies, mm-hmm. starting farms mm-hmm. and businesses and getting on with, uh, with life. And, but... Women were politically thrown under the bus um, at the time. They fought alongside mm-hmm. men for those rights, for their communal rights, uh, and but they didn't get them themselves. Um, and and it was when I realised that it was that the next great kind of nation building moment, which in Australian history, which is federation, that it, women then stood up again and said, "Well, we'll be part of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we want this too, but we want to be included this time." And you're not going to throw us under the bus again. And and Australian women fought for the right to vote, and were the first, and we were the first country in the world to give white women full political equality, meaning the right to vote and the right to stand for parliament. And that story is also one that gets left behind, mm-hmm. um, that we take for granted, mm-hmm. um, that we um, go about our daily lives as modern women. Um, un- uh, unsure and unclear as to how it is that we even came to be living these lives. Mm-hmm. And so that's what the second book is about. And in particular, it's about the Australian women who went and fought as part of the British suffragette movement. Um, again, another part of our history that we've tended to overlook in favour of other narratives, in particular uh, the Anzac narrative, which poses itself as the as the birth of the nation, um, quite erroneously, because the nation was born at Federation, mm. and the values that the nation stood for, in, pati- po- in particular the politically progressive values mm. of democracy and inclusion, mm. have been really um, completely forgotten mm. uh, in in terms of um, the overtaking of that militaristic. N- narrative of Anzac. So I'm really um, taking readers' minds back to that first decade Mm. and a half before Gallipoli when Australia was known throughout the world as the global exemplar of democracy. I think that it is good for our present democracy, the Mm. state of our our present state of feeling um, empowered, enfranchised, for that to be meaningful, for that to be something that is worth fighting for, Mm. for us to understand Mm. how very much people wanted it, needed it and fought for it. Also much because what we do in in the present day with suffrage especially is we look to what happened in the US and UK and think that that's our story and that does it for us and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. The Australian suffrage movement was the one that lit the spark Mm -hmm. so it's very interesting Mm -hmm. october 1st you daughters (laughs) of freedom please look out for it now i am going to throw to the audience in just a moment i do have a couple of questions here though that came in via twitter um so a a couple of these are just 
yes or no's maybe. Um, Andre Poppleton from Hobart wanted to know, Anne, if mm-hmm. you'll be working on set like you did for Outlander over here in Australia. Um, it's certainly, that would be my intention. Yeah. Um, it just kind of depends on all everything, what all is shaken out at the time. But yeah, because you, you, it is a strange system for me that you would just write your script and hand it to somebody else and walk away is very strange. Um, so I, I would be hopeful, yes, to be here and then everybody who's writing to get their chance to be yeah. on the set as well. And you've obviously liked... like you. Yes, that's true. <laughs> well, I was going to say, did, you liked Australia enough to come back as well. And, oh, and I love Australia. What I've good. seen of it is fantastic. Plus, I got to see koala bears and kangaroos. Yay, and we like very that. exciting. Uh, Larissa Hoffman from Wollongong asked a question that I'm going to slightly um, change a little bit. In terms of getting pre-production support, what does it mean to have an internationally renowned writer and producer um, helping to attract an audience? I would also a- add to that, clearly this is a room full of people who want to see this on their screens. What can we do to help make this happen? And I believe your lovely producer was already saying that the likes of the ABC and the commercial networks as well, they pay attention when you call into the switchboard or you send them an email or a letter or you tweet at them and you say, hey, this is a really good show that's happening. And and also as a caveat to that too, it would help if you wrote to your MPs saying, hey, don't, don't slash ABC funding because mm-hmm. that is... That is who predominantly makes these sort of shows. So what can we do as audiences who want to see this get up? What can we do to help assist, apart from also buying your book? Uh, that was what Buy I was going to say. The, you know, the more people that buy the book, it becomes, um, you know, a, a phenomenon. And then people that, that encourages uh, producers and the people with money. Uh, everybody, in my experience, they're looking for somebody else to, who's already said yes so if there is a feeling like, oh, this is a piece of material that everyone is interested in and they've said yes, that just helps them make mm-hmm. those decisions. FOMO. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, don't, I don't know other than I think, yes, and, um, I, I can't speak to really in Australia writing. I mean, that seems like a, a good idea, mm-hmm. again, mm-hmm. in the States. And I think we are you know, trying to, we may try to get some international money. I'm not sure what, what you can do other than buy the book. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Okay, I would say buy the book and also at and yeah. tweet and email mm-hmm. and write letters to the likes of the ABC and the commercial networks just saying, hey, this is a really great thing that's happening over here and we want to see stories like this. Mm-hmm. And this story specifically, I would say do that. And include Sam Hewen's Twitter handle. <laughs> <laughs> can't hurt. Really can't hurt. Let's now throw it to the audience. Could you please stick your hand up if you have a question for anybody on the stage? I can't really see anything. There's somebody <laughs> over right here. Nice. Oh, over here. We have somebody over here, Ari. Oh, somebody coming down. Oh, just wait for the microphone for a second. Sorry. We have uh, two microphones coming around. Yeah. Thank you. We are live streaming, so the people want to hear hello. you. Hello. Um, hello. Thank you also for your beautiful work. Um, I don't just want to ask, um, you've talked about democracy and rebellion, but is it the love story that is integral to the this, this history telling? Or um, or does it just enhance it, or is it a side issue, or, or what? Well, I don't have a love story in the book mm-hmm. uh, because I didn't find a love story in the archives, and so that was is certainly going. There will be there certainly will be love stories, and we have um, had so much fun concocting them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, so that is going to be part of the make believe. Um, and said before that that um, she very generously said that I've been very open to um, playing a bit fast mm-hmm, and loose with mm-hmm. the facts. Uh, I, I see it as being able to be flexible about the facts in order to cleave as closely as possible to the truth, and they're co- two quite different things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think definitely we want to, again, tell the character stories and um, then the... Um, backdrop isn't quite right but that that gives us this great world and all the things that they're the history gives us all the things that they're dealing with um and i would also say and hopefully we can make compelling that that these women are also um wanting something other than just romance they're wanting some agency is the word you use in this world um which i think again in outlander claire does she's a doctor she wants to do that kind of thing so it isn't just about um, her relationship with Jamie that's driving the story. It's, um, it, well, initially in the first part of it, it's she wants to get back home. So she's, what am I going to do to get there? So I think that, yeah, we'll do both things. And I think, but I think definitely the characters are front and center. And then we run them through this, this wonderful story that we have. 
Okay. Any other questions? Oh, one down the front. Oh, yep. Yeah. Um, I had a question for Claire. Um, when you're researching something like this where there are stories that we don't know a lot about, um, where do you even begin? Mm. Like, you said you found Catherine Bentley first, but where do you go from there? How did you find all these other women and their stories? Uh, I, I begin in the place that all historians begin and the same place that all the um, male historians who had already written histories of Eureka began, which is... Um, in the archives, in the Public Records Office, in the State Library of Victoria, uh, looking at Hansard, looking at Royal Commissions, looking at the, the huge amount of correspondence that went backwards and forwards between Ballarat and, um, and Melbourne, between Governor Hotham and the Gold Commissioners on Ballarat. I looked at inquest records, um, publicans' records, um, diaries, letters, manuscripts from the period. Um, I'd often just plug in a, um, a keyword search for 1854 at the State Library and see what came up um, from that rather than necessarily going Eureka uh, because that might be a much narrower pool. The main difference is that I went, uh, I, I went into those archives armed with a different set of research questions than previous historians had. So I went looking for women. And because they were there, I mm. spent a mm. really long time in the archives. It's not like it took me 10 years because it was really hard to find anything. It took me 10 years because there was so much bloody stuff. And, uh, I, and it's really hard not to use um, gold mining analogies to um, think about your research <laughs> when you're doing this. But I, I often thought it's like panning for gold. Um, you know, the, what the miners did is you take a big shovel and you chuck it into the, the pan, you slush it around and you pour off all of the mullock, which is all the dross, the stuff you don't need, and what's left in the pan is the, is the flecks of gold. Well, that sh first shovel is like going into the archives, chucking it into the pan, swishing it around. And when I, the, the, the mullock that I pour off is all the stuff that other people have said before and that we've all heard of, and the flecks of gold are, are the women that are left there is Catherine Bentley and there's Clara Seacamp and there's there's hundreds of them I had to narrow it down um, whereas th all of those got tipped out in the in the sludge mm -hmm. by the previous historians because they just they weren't looking for them they didn't think they were relevant they didn't think they were significant it wasn't interesting to them um, and because uh, historians are people too and we go looking for the things that we're interested in it's also that you're a detective. I've already cited that. Mm -hmm. Was there another question somewhere at the back? Who's got a microphone already? Hi there. Uh, thank you so much for that, uh, Claire and Anne. It's really enjoyable. Uh, my question is about, uh, do you anticipate that uh, there may be some kind of um, issues around, like the Australian cultural cringe, like that we have issues about seeing our own um, like culture projected back to us? And, or do you think perhaps maybe having you know so many international characters might be a way to kind of unseat that. Um, just this idea that Australian mm. history has, you know, traditionally been seen as a bit stale or boring or that kind of thing. Do you want me to explain cultural cringe? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I don't know what that is. It's like, Australia, it's like explaining Australia, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it is. So I keep having, over the last two weeks, it's like, this is a meat pie. <laughs> <laughs> What's inside it? We don't know. <laughs> yeah, that was a little scary. <laughs> Um, so cultural cringe is the idea that we shy away as Australians from the from our our own stories, our own landscape, um, our own heroes, in preference to the rest of the world, particularly the Northern Hemisphere and Europe, a kind of Euro Eurocentric and then later on um, American centric mm -hmm. view of things. That everything that happens somewhere else is better, and mm -hmm. everything that happens here is. Um, lesser. So mm -hmm. to give you a prime example of it, we have a timber species here, um, I know this because my husband's a furniture maker, that's called she-oak. Mm -hmm. It's called she-oak because the she is supposed to denote that it's a lesser version of European oak. Wow. So that's a hmm. cl classic example of uh, environmental cultural. Oof, that fringe. was a little bit mm -hmm. too uncomfortably on the on on the on the on the head. <laughs> well done. Yeah. So now do you want to answer that question? Can you remember the question? I can't entirely. So you th you're asking if we think that including these in international characters will make it less cringy? Is that what the question was? Mm, essentially. Um, I, 
I, I can't answer that question because I don't have cultural cringe. In fact, the Americans probably have the opposite. We could kind of go the other. We could probably, you know, uh, benefit from a little cringing. Um, so I, I, I just, you know, again, I just hope that it's a story that everyone will really appreciate and, um, and you know, w again, has that international feel to it. I think you can probably address the Australian mm. reaction better than I can, certainly. Well, I think it'd be really dumb and really parochial if Australians say, because we've got an American screenwriter, that somehow means that we've got outsiders telling our story. Um, as I hope I explained before, this is an outsider's story. Mm -hmm. This is an immigrant story. We are an immigrant nation. Mm -hmm. These are our stories. And, and uh, we've always been made um, and we've all by people who have come and, and narrated their experiences of being here. Mm -hmm. um, I've read hundreds of, of accounts of people who came here during the gold rushes from somewhere else and talked about what their experience was like. Mm -hmm. Now, though many of those people stayed, the majority stayed and they became Australians. Mm -hmm. um, so is their account an outsider's account or is an insider's account? I mean, where, where do we draw the line? So I think um, it will be really narrow-minded and I'd be very disappointed if Australians didn't embrace the idea that uh, this is a story for everybody with really universal themes, with um, many um, themes that are still touch points in our society today in terms of the way that we relate to strangers in terms of um, foreigners coming to, it, to, to the place. Uh, um, Governor Hotham wanted to blame the Eureka Rebellion on the foreigners, um, mm. by whom he meant the Irish, um, in order to safeguard the uh, reputations of the English who were also fighting at Eureka. And he made a special amnesty for the Americans who were fighting at Eureka because he was afraid of them. Um, so, you know, this is, it's a complicated story with many resonances today. And I, and I also I think, think it's, um, it's, as, it's, as you've touched on, this is history that we think we know, but we don't know. That's mm -hmm. going to avoid the cultural cringe. I think if this was telling the tale that we'd all learn in primary school, and I certainly did, of just a bunch of blokes living their, their bachelor lives on the final frontier, then that would be really cringy. But because this is a story that we all think we know, but we actually don't. And I also think that the cast... Um, it's going to be very multicultural and it's going to be very obvious that it's a multicultural cast. And hopefully it's um, going to make people think, huh, that's not the image I had of Eureka. That's not the image I, I read in history books in primary school all those years. A and one of the things that we have um, discussed, we don't know ha quite how we'll deal with this yet, is that um, there's no Australian accent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, how do you how how are we going to create that accent? Well, the accent is the accents of the people who were there, mm -hmm. who are the English and the Irish, and many of them were still speaking Gaelic to each other, mm -hmm. um, and and the French, and we've got a French character, and um, and the Germans and the Americans had their mm -hmm. own particular forms of language. Um, so uh, again, Deadwood is kind of a good m model because uh, Deadwood's almost kind of Shakespearean in the way that you have to get your ear in mm -hmm. to the language mm -hmm. of that program before you can really start taking on what's going going on in terms of the narrative and I think that we're going to have the same challenges. And I think from honestly from an outsider's point of view it's it's a really great opportunity for people in you know America, Ireland, England to have a different relationship to Australia because yeah. you look at it and you say oh wow I have a connection there because mm -hmm. people from my country went and were part of that country. So I, I'm, I have some Australian connection too, uh, which I think will be really cool. Because mm. many of, uh, only think of us in terms of World War One and Two. That was when we came on to their sort of, you know, um, psyche was yes. when we entered into that arena with them. But it's not. That was a really good question though, even though mm -hmm. cultural cringe is cringy to talk about. And there was somebody <laughs> at the front, I believe. Well, one, last one last question. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, and I loved your, um, not Anne, sorry, Claire, I loved your book. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter-in-law writes a history blog and she put me onto it. Her, her name is Yvonne Perkins, you might remember her. I or do know, know her. Yvonne. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to, um, my question was to, to Anne. I wonder if you, if you could explain to us the, the process of, of actually transferring uh, the the book material the 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 base material to to the script um, take us through the writers room if you like 
quickly. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I, I could probably tell you more in a couple of months, but um, I, I mean, I think the process will be to we've we've really talked a lot, so there's a lot of input. So now I will go home, and um, one of the things I like to do um, when I do a book adaptation is to sort of set it aside and then say, what do I remember? What are the things that really made an impact on me? Oh, those, that's a good place to start. So now I know those are pieces that I, that I uh, want to put in there. Um, and then, uh, I mean, the process will be that I'll go through and I'll kind of try to think about, um, you know, which stories do we want to tell? How do we want to do this? And then I will write uh, what is basically what we would call a beat sheet. I'll say these are the, the basically the, the beats of the story that we want to tell. And then I'll send that to Mark and to Claire. And then we'll have a discussion about what works, what doesn't work, what do we want and we don't want. Then the next step is writing an outline, which is taking those beats and making them bigger. And we, once again, will have a discussion about how is this working. And then from there is a script. So that's kind of how the, the process would, would work. It's, it's steps. Steps that, remember, is going to maybe take two years to actually get to our screens. But, 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 just to reiterate, if you could tweet at the ABC, tweet at Channel 7, Channel 9, Channel 10, hashtag Forgotten Rebels, write to them, email them, whatever you can do, tell your MPs not to slash ABC funding because yeah. this is how this show will get made. Is, uh, and also buy the book. For gosh mm -hmm. sake, it's Father's Day is around the corner. This is going to be a fantastic present. Buy the book. <laughs> you all want this. I want this. Are you kidding me? So make it happen. Show your enthusiasm. Forget the cultural cringe. Make it work. And I just want to say thank you to Anne Kenny and Claire Wright for this opportunity and to La Trobe University and the Australian Centre for the Moving Image for hosting us. And thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank and you thank so you, much. Danielle. Thank you, Danielle. It was great. It was great. <laughs>